All right, so everything got it connected, very good. Wait for some folks to start rolling in. All right, hello, Frank Drew. We are live here today, Book Talk on Book Talk, uh, special Tuesday edition. And today we have some fantastic uh, guests, and we, we had someone from Australia on um, earlier this month. Now we're getting two uh, folks from across the pond. Um, we have Jay Darkmore, who uh, I'll have to ask you if it's a pen name, but he writes uh, darker fantasy and horror and stuff like that. And Lou Collins, uh, and she has uh, written uh, a cozy mystery, sort of like... Uh, uh, Agatha Christie, am- or amateur sleuth type stuff, uh, and uh, that's uh, her debut. So we're going to talk to both of them. And uh, you know, if you've uh, been watching me for a while, you know that I love accents. So uh, I can't wait to hear uh, them speak. And uh, you know, we'll talk about differences between what goes on over on their side of the pond and um, how things work over here, uh, if there are any differences. Um, you know, other than like you know a little language stuff and copy editing and all that stuff. Um, and so we're going to wait for uh, Lou and Jay to get here. We also, as always, have uh, Tanya, Celtic uh, Blue to you. She's going to be uh, moderating down in the comments, uh, the executive producer of the show. And so uh, we, uh, let's see, nope, uh, can't wait to see uh, to see them come. And before, before we get our guests, one thing, uh, I guess the big piece of news out of the publishing industry is uh, USA Today suspending their bestseller list. Uh, you know, it came about because of the layoffs happening at Gannett. And uh, I have friends who still work for Gannett, and those layoffs have been going on for a while. Um, but I think laying off the editor who uh, does or who did the USA Today bestseller list is probably one of the most high profile um, uh, laying, layings off that they've had in quite some time. Uh, it's mostly been, you know, uh, daily journalists kind of, um, I don't want to say rank and file because uh, at this point, every journalist that uh, a newspaper has, especially when the size of USA Today is very needed. Um, but um, the bestseller list does not actually generate revenue for the newspaper outside of, they probably have affiliate links if you go ahead and buy one of their books while you're reading the list. But other than that, uh, it is not a profit center. Uh, but what it is, is it is a huge um, part of their branding, in my opinion, because, you know, there are thousands of books out there that say USA Today bestseller, um, either, you know, mostly on the cover. And that is just, you know, the kind of branding you really uh, almost can't can't buy uh, unless you're counting any type of loss that they uh, incur based on the man hours it took for um, the woman who curated the list um, to log every day. It's, uh, uh, you know, the USA Today list was considered uh, pretty democratic. It was one of those that uh, if you had the right strategy, uh, indie folks could make it uh, in addition to traditionally published authors. And I know a few indie published authors who uh, I know more than a few actually who've been who've been on the uh, USA Today bestseller list. And a lot of friends, uh, whether or not they are uh, traditionally or indie published, who uh, get to put that on every single one of their books. and. Uh, you know, I, I thought about trying to launch uh, and do campaigns like that, but uh, I um, it never seemed like I would get quite enough return based on my readership and mailing list and all that stuff. Uh, I'm in the process of rebuilding all that. So, um, you know, and getting on the USA Today bestsellers was part of that. So now I'm not sure um, how, how all that's going to go. Um, you know, if they don't bring it back and, and you go a few years without having you say today bestseller list, not only is that going to give fewer authors the chance to say that they're bestsellers, but it's also going to reduce the clout that uh, covers and authors who authors who are already on the bestseller list who get to say they uh, have been a USA Today, USA Today bestseller. Uh, all the covers that that is on and everything like that is going to decrease in value. Uh, maybe not monetary value, obviously, but to, in terms of um, how much readers put in, how much weight they put into whether or not you were on the bestseller list or not. And uh, so it's definitely not a good thing. Uh, and uh, I really hope that they do bring the USA Today bestseller list back. Um, 
because that'll, uh, you know, that'll be pretty, uh, uh, it'll have far reaching effects, I guess. Uh, and, and if it's just until January or February, then, you know, that's, uh, that's not too bad. And let's hope that they are actively looking to find somebody to uh, go ahead and, and take up the, the mantle and start um, putting the uh, USA, Day, USA Today bestseller list back out. But for those who, um, you know, because the book release, books release every day, really, but, uh, you know, Tuesday is release day for most books. And uh, for those who are trying to get on the USA Today bestseller list, um, you know, on the weeks where they didn't have one, if they had already spent the money and chosen their release date and, uh, you know, dumped sometime, you know, thousands of dollars or 10,000, tens of thousands of dollars into advertising in a bunch of different places, usually BookBub, and then there's several big mailing lists and uh, other places, and even increasing their standard Amazon and Facebook advertising. If they did all that in preparation for getting on the USA Today bestseller list uh, in these last couple of weeks, then that has got to be super frustrating. And I haven't read any, uh, here we go, there's Jay. Go ahead and invite him. Um, but if if you know anyone who has uh, uh, done that and who feels like they've wasted their money, uh, you know, let us know and we can try to see if uh, we can get some comments from them. But it'll be interesting to see um, what, the, what the fallout is immediately with those who uh, did not get on the list when they were trying to uh, this month. And then depending on how long the list is on hiatus, uh, whether or not there are even um, more implications down the line. Uh, and uh, I I feel fortunate, I guess, maybe right now that I uh, was not banking on, um, on that bestseller list and I didn't have that uh, as a big part of my campaign. So we'll see. Looks like Jay is connecting. Hello. Hey, how are hey, you? Hey, I'm sir? here. How are you doing? You okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm good. How are you doing? I can't complain, man. It's a little bit later where we are. So it's yeah. just it's a little bit after my bedtime, this, but I decided to step specifically to speak to your wonderful self. So. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, I, I can hear you. And, uh, you know, uh, I haven't seen any comments uh, asking why we can't hear you. So I guess uh, everything's good there. And uh, oh, Fingers crossed. Uh, and that's good. We've got another lady joining as well, haven't we? Yes, yes, uh, Lou Collins. And I'm going to turn my volume up just a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I've just turned my brightness up and I've turned my volume up. So I can see myself. I can see you. I can hear you both. Well, I can hear you great. So hopefully it's all good. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, Lou Collins is who's going to be joining us, and she's also from um, the UK, so uh, it'll be, uh, and we appreciate you staying up late, we're, we're not going to stay uh, stay on too awful long because of that, uh, uh, it was a little easier, I think, to coordinate with you two than it was whenever we had a gentleman from Australia, that uh, he, he's, uh, he was like almost like 12 or 14 hours in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're just a little further at night, so you're coming to us from the future, but uh, not not quite as far in the future as, <laughs> as they were. I always think it's weird when you look at different time zones, because it's like, what I've done today hasn't even existed in your time zone yet. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like looking, so hello from the future, mm -hmm. as you said. Oh, well, you're I mean, saying hello from the past to me, so either way, right. it can get a bit interesting. Right. Well, and the only time that really comes up, I guess, is uh, um, with... Uh, like like broadcast TV that's that's live maybe where it's being filmed like in the east or something like that. But hold on, Tanya is messaging me. Uh... I think it's crazy in America. Like you guys are so big, you have different time zones. Mm -hmm. Like in the UK, it's it's seven o'clock everywhere or it's midnight everywhere. Well, you guys, you can be at one side of America and be like, yeah, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, and then somewhere else it can be like five, six, seven o'clock even a little bit earlier. So that's, that's nuts. Just yeah. Yeah. And, the place. Well, I, and that's, that's what I was talking about uh, with uh, television and time zones is a lot of times you have stuff that is, uh, that is uh, filmed um, live in the, on the East coast in New York, take like Saturday night live, right? That's, that's a good example. It's filmed live. It, it's, and it's broadcast live in New York, but then for the West coast, they have a tape delay. And so if they wanted to, they could get in there and they could break in. 
but uh, everything that uh, people are watching, you know, live, live on the West Coast has already happened. And so if, if there's any if there's any uh, new information coming on, you know, during Saturday Night Live, then it wouldn't actually get to them for a couple hours later. And of course, you know, here uh, it's interesting you bring that up. I don't often think about the fact that there is. Uh, OK, that, uh, the fact that there is only uh, one time zone. And and that uh, you know that that is so so very foreign to me because anytime unless I know I'm talking to somebody in the central time zone where I'm from, I always have to account for when and where they are. And sometimes I do the math backwards and I try to get a hold of somebody three hours early and it's uh, <laughs> uh, so doing sounds, that math. sounds like a nightmare. So it just it just adds issues to like logistical problems. It's just uh, yeah. I, you know I'm happy that I know that if it's, if I need to see speak to someone in London or someone in Scotland, I know what time it is. And it's uh, it's better. So um, so how are you anyway, man? You've asked me a couple of questions, like you know how I'm doing. I'm doing good. Um, how are you? How are you doing, Rick? Uh, doing all right. You know, I uh, I'm I, I got over the the flu, which was uh, uh, not a whole lot of fun. But uh, I'm you know I I'm always more comfortable asking asking the questions. Uh, um, one thing I am doing is I I am uh, I am writing uh, a new work in progress, and I'm coming up to the first uh, you know breaking into the second act. So I'm. Uh, I'm kind of trying to figure out how, how I'm going to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess we're, uh, you know, so we're past the time that we said we we're going to start. So people are going to start rolling in. Uh, I did want to ask you, um, you know, today we have a little bit of a, a contrast in styles and we'll start with you. You write uh, darker stuff. You write uh, dark fantasy stuff that leans toward horror. And, you know, most of my thrillers are considered noir. So I'm right there with you on writing uh, on the on the darker side of, of stuff. Um, but you, some of your um, videos that you posted, you've had to say, you know, just so you know, this is this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about. Uh, how much studying of psychology uh, have you done uh, to inform how you write your books? Because I definitely uh, sometimes I have to go back and refresh myself, but I, I definitely um, tried to study as much as I can about what makes people do the darker mm -hmm. things that we have them do in our books. So uh, a few answers to that, Rick. So uh, I studied psychology in college. Um, hmm. uh, so go. not like university, but like A-levels college. Uh, so studied there, quite enjoyed it. Um, since I've developed, I've read a few books. So uh, there's one really good book on trauma called uh, The Body Keeps Score. There's also um, uh, a, a book, of, I can't remember its name exactly, but it's uh, by a psychologist called Dr. Ramanish. He talks about um, narcissistic abuse. There's also a book um, about borderline personality disorder called um, uh, I Love You, Don't Leave Me. That one's really good. Uh, there's The Cult of One by Richard Grannon. Um, I've digested thousands of hours of YouTube content about it all. And also in uh, in uh, I have a background in crime investigation as well, so I deal a lot with uh, with people, with what makes people tick, and also through that I get to speak to social workers, I get to speak to psychiatrists, I get to speak to criminal law investigators. Um, so uh, I'm not an expert. I've never said I was an expert with, in the field. I don't have any letters after my name. I'm not a psychologist, psychiatrist, but I do have a very keen interest in it, in the sense of I like. I like looking into trauma. I like looking how trauma can affect people, PTSD, uh, and how that can manifest itself in relationships. I like looking at um, personality disorders. I like looking at abusive patterns and just seeing how we can make those um, characteristics into into a character and how it can convey during the writing as well. So, yeah, like I said, not a, not an expert, but I like to think I have. A, like a layman's kind of grasp on it, a, a bit more of, a, of an educated guess, I would say. And um, and also, you know, through like personal experience and stuff like that as well, it's it's been able to convey uh, the thoughts, the feelings and the characteristics in a, in a constructive way, uh, which are then conveyed through the characters. And I like to think I do an OK job at it. You know, I've not had anyone tell me that anything's wrong. But, you know, like I said, not an expert, but it makes more fun characters when people are more flawed. And uh, people have uh, a bit more, um, I don't know, like that darker side of the person come out. Hello, Tanya. How are you? So, Yes. And, and hi, Tanya. She's an executive producer. She's with us. And uh, Evie Black has been uh, sending, a, sending us a lot of likes. And we appreciate that. That um, 
you know, that, that helps boost our, our visibility, helps get more people uh, here viewing the show. Uh, so, you know, we love it when people like our videos, you know, and there's uh, um, all the gifts and everything people do, like, uh, very much appreciated. And if, uh, if you like what we're talking about and you want other people to join in, you can share, uh, share to your friends, share this live, you know, that always helps too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, uh, and so, yeah, so Tanya says that she's, uh, she's reminding Lou that, uh, you know, she, uh, she should be coming on. Uh, and so you have, uh, you have two books out. Is that, do I have that right? I have a few. So I've got, um, I, I've, 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 uh, I think last count was five or six. Um, so they're not all full length novels. So I have, um, I have a thriller novel. Well, I have a horror novel. I have two dark fantasy novels. Uh, I have a collection of short stories. I have another collection of short stories, including with novellas as well. And I've also written a uh, first novel of a crime series. I'm also in the process of writing a second novel in a crime series. And I've released two novellas uh, from the wider stuff. So I have a few out, a few out. Um, I like to keep it, even though my writing is generally on the darker side, I don't want to just be fitting into a box to say that I only write mystery, I only write horror, because I like to read different things too. So rather than just saying um, I specifically write this genre, it's just easy to say I write the darker side of fiction because that can uh, incorporate and encompass a lot of other genres as well. But albeit still, like you'll never get me catching, you never catch me writing like um, like a like a I don't know like a chick flick or like a girly <laughs> romance or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wrote a, I wrote a tragic romance in a, in one of my novellas. That that was quite interesting, and that got to play with like elements of Dante's Inferno. Um, a couple of movies, what I quite like as well, uh, such as What Dreams May Come. I love that movie. Um, and just how far someone will go to fulfil a promise to a loved one after they're deceased and what ramifications would their choices have. And it was actually based off, it's a story called um, called The Ghost in the Mist. And it's a story based off the old English folk uh, song called The House Carpenter. And it's a story about a guy who goes to war. It's based in World War II. He goes to war. Um, and he promises his wife that he will be back. No matter what happens, he will come back to her. And what happens is, sadly, he he meets his end while on the battlefield. And the he's stood uh, in the afterlife and he has the option to go to heaven to move on to the next life, but forsake his promise to his loved one. Or he can sell his soul to the devil and he can return back to uh, to his love and fulfill his promise. So it's that, does love transcend death? And if it does, what form will it take? So we had quite a lot of fun writing that one. But but, um, but yeah, it, to, to answer your question, yes, I write, I write lots of different stuff. <laughs> so. And, and so I have, uh, I have two um, two questions to, that kind of came from that. One is, uh, is Jay Darkmore, is that a pen name? Or, or do, you, do you happen to have Dark in your last name as a Dark... Uh, writer <laughs> that would be quite convenient wouldn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> no it is a pen name it is a pen name yeah it's not my real name it's similar to my real name but it's not my pen name. it's not my real name and, and do you write all all of the different genres and stuff that you just said you wrote uh did you write them all under that same pen name yes so they're all uh, okay. they're all under they're all um under the same pen name um i'm thinking if i was to write say some non-fiction or maybe go complete u-turn on the genre I would maybe look at considering a different pen name, but as for this channel and for you know the promotion of, of who I am, this is the Jay Dartmoor brand. If I was to go do something else, it'd probably be a bit more faceless, uh, a bit more anonymous, and maybe promote it through advertising, uh, sold the advertising that way and see what happens. I know a couple of writers do that, like Joanna Penn, she writes um, mm-hmm. thrillers uh, on yeah. JF Penn and then her other stuff on Joanna Penn, but she also has like um, romance novels under completely different names. And I know a few authors do that as well. So um, same question back to you, Rick. So do you just write under your soul? Is Rick your real name? Do you write under Rick or do you have a pen name? Uh, so yeah, Rick Treon is, is my name. The, uh, the one thing I did is my, my full name is Richard Darius Treon the fourth. And wow. so, uh, yeah, I definitely, that's, uh, you know, wouldn't ever go with my full name, but, uh, Rick is my, <laughs> Rick is my father and his father was, uh, went by Dick because that, you know, was the times and we don't even know what my great, uh, grandfather went by. So, uh, I, I've, I've been Ricky most of my life, but since I write for an adult audience, 
you know, I dropped the Y because I, I looked at it and said, well, you know, it's not Jimmy Patterson or Stevie King. So, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, Rick, uh, Rick works and Richard, I just, I have never, uh, the only time I ever have ever answered that name is, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie, uh, Tommy boy. Uh, it was no, kind of an American. That. Yeah. It's kind of an American cult classic comedy, but anyway, there's, uh, uh, and it doesn't quite work because I look more like Chris Farley than, uh, um, oh, I always forget the the shorter gentleman uh, who's in the movie, but uh, what? But the shorter guy's name name was uh, was Richard, and so Chris Farley would like say his name in a weird voice that I'm not going to try mm. to imitate. But I had some friends in college who who would do that to me, so that was the only time I ever responded to Richard. So um, so yeah, Rick Trion. That is my that is you know one derivation of my real name. It's my real last name, uh, and all four of my novels are under under that one name. And all of the, they're all crime fiction. I have one, Divided States, just a little bit of an outlier in that it's a, a little more of an action thriller. But mm-hmm. uh, um, but yeah, I haven't strayed very far from from my uh, from my niche. And the the only thing I would consider a pen name, and I wouldn't do it for nonfiction either because I was a journalist for a long time, okay. and my bio, my byline was Ricky Treon. Uh, so I might add the Y back in if I did anything uh, nonfiction, especially if it. Uh, if it related to um, a story I've worked on in the past or something like that. Um, but uh, if I were to write something uh, like, like a fantasy or like a romance or something like that, I probably would go ahead and do a, uh, do a pen name. And of course, you know, have a different website and different social medias. And that's one of the reasons why when people ask me, you know, should I, should I use a pen name if I'm writing two separate subgenres? Like how much of a commitment do you want to make? Because, you really have to duplicate everything you've already done for your one name. Um, the difference being probably your email list. You probably wouldn't have to try to have two separate ones of those. You would just let people know what's going on with both your pen names because the email list is the most personal thing that you have, right? That's the one where people are generally getting a behind the scenes look at you. Um, and uh, it's, you know, hopefully, you know, it's the one you focus on really uh, growing uh, and having a real good connection with. So, those people, you should tell them. In fact, that's what I would do is I would say, hey, email readers, you're the first to know I'm working on this new project and I'm going to do it under a pen name. And so that by the time it comes out, they already know exactly who you are and mm-hmm. all that stuff. Uh, but in terms of your social media website, uh, all, all of this stuff, <coughs> pardon me, you have to duplicate it. And so that's what I tell them is like how much work do you want to put in. If there's subgenres that are close, like mine, you know, thriller and, you know, action oriented thriller versus um crime fiction and really more uh more suspense uh you know and and a little more mystery like those are related enough that i i think that you know my audience wasn't segmented too badly and uh i did i had a few people who uh read my other stuff who who don't uh read action thrillers but still read mine Mm. and they still found my author voice and they still like my characters because i was still me the voice is still mine it was just a different uh, you know, a slightly different uh, angle toward it. Um, now you've, uh, you talked about all those stuff you've written, uh, but you also do a whole lot of other stuff other than just writing. You have a, you have a, a Facebook group that you monitor, you have a YouTube channel, you have a, uh, like a horror podcast. Um, do you just hate sleep? I mean, how, uh, you know, what, pretty much, uh, why, pretty why, much. <laughs> well, why, why do you do so many things? I just oh, I think you kind of have to these days because uh, because you know there's a lot of people doing this and um, and uh, oh Lou's joining us hello Lou yep um, so I think because there's so much, I, I don't know I don't know if it's a case of competition or something like that but I think because <laughs> I want to do much more than just write stories I want to be uh, a voice in the, in the community I want I feel that I have knowledge I can pass on hello hello hey, Lou. hello um, apologies. I feel that I uh, no I have... no worries. We know that you know it's kind of off hours for you guys <laughs> over there in the UK. So we we are all good. Just just to catch you up, uh, Jay was talking about all the you know he he writes a lot of different things in a lot of different genres. And then I said, and oh by the way, he's got a podcast, he's got a YouTube channel, he runs a Facebook group. So he was just telling us about uh, why he has his fingers in so many different projects and uh, how important that is in uh, in today's. Uh, market so uh sorry to interrupt go ahead and uh, continue your thought Jim. oh it's all good man lou very nice to see you nice to nice to have you on mate um i'm glad i, I found you... it in the end <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so i think the reason is rick is the reason why i like doing so much is because i just think i i like exploring different mediums i like speaking to camera i like editing videos 
I like being a bit more spontaneous with things that I can do. I love the storytelling. That's my number one love. I love doing that. But I also want to, I don't know, give a bit more myself to the people that follow me. And if I can offer a bit of advice, if I can offer some support, or if I can give indie readers uh, a voice on my podcast. Um, it's had to take a bit of a back step recently uh, just because of other things which are going on. But what I what I like to do is I will get someone who writes indie horror and I will read one of their stories, give them a bit of a free platform, give them a bit of exposure just to give something back to the indie community because it's hard to get your voice heard uh, as an independent writer, as I'm sure we're all aware. Um, with the with the Facebook group, that's nice to, to you know cultivate and to talk to people on a bit more personal level. Um, building email lists as well is a huge thing. Um, certainly something which I've spoken to a couple of indie writers and they've gone, oh, I don't need an email list. I'm not going to bother building one. And it's like, but, but, they they then become your fans. They're your fans. They're your readers. You build a much more personal connection with them, and through that way, you, you get readers, and you get a fan. Then you get you know. Then eventually, they become they become friends. They become avid readers, and you get that connection with them. Um, and people become you know people get uh, attached emotionally to other people as well. So if they can see you, they can hear you, they can hear you speak, they can pick your brains. Then I just think it makes more for a much more personal connection to the people you're trying to reach and the people that follow you. But at the same time, um, it's just it's just more fun and entertaining, and it breaks things up as well for me. What I like to do, that that's the reason why I'd say I have more than one uh, platform. And uh, I, like you said, I don't like sleep. So, <laughs> right, and, and and so and so, Lou, uh, you know, one of the uh, um, things I wanted to to ask you about you you have um, you had you had your debut novel come out, and then you wrote a prequel novella. Do I have that right? Yes, I do. I have, well, I kind of, um, I wrote about 75% of the debut and then I thought, then I realised I needed um, okay. a something for people to test drive me. That's what I normally say, which sometimes gets some weird looks when I say <laughs> to people, hey, for a test drive, they're a bit like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so then I wrote that. Um, gotcha. Which actually, which actually worked well because um, it was actually easier to link um, the taster to the book. So I actually, I actually think it worked out well in the end. So I wrote that, um, and then I started um, started the newsletter. There you go, JC. Mm -hmm. I'm a newsletter gal. Yeah, so I started that before I'd even released the first book with mm -hmm. the novella. And then now the two things kind of work in tandem. So, yeah. And, and that's what my publisher and I, I did too. I, uh, I wrote the first novel and uh, submitted it. And while they were editing it, they asked me, hey, could you, if you can think of a good story, um, you know, could you write some sort of prequel novella? That way uh, we had that as, um, you know, a loss leader is a lot of times they talk about it in marketing. And it can help uh, drive people to that book. And then we were planning on uh, a sequel that eventually came out. So it's kind of a kind of three pieces of property there. And uh, talking about building your email list, that's what I'm uh, I've been doing right now. Is uh, are I'm not even sure is, is book funnel a thing in the UK? Are you all familiar with book funnel at all? Yeah, I, I did it. Um, I, I, I went on it. I tried it. I uh, couldn't really get the hang of it. Maybe <laughs> I was just trying to do too much at once, and maybe didn't give it a proper go. But I went on it, and uh, it, I didn't really get much from it. But I have heard people swear by it say you know it's a great thing to do uh for me i i, I don't know i just didn't get that into it i i have found it it just took a while i mean you know like a, a couple of years but i finally uh and i also in addition to the novella i have a, a collection of short stories that i'd already written and published in uh, my local writing club the texas high plains writers uh they publish an anthology every year and so uh, that's the only time i write short stories is just to have something in there because uh, they like having, you know, those of us who um, ha have a, a little bit of an established audience, they like for us to have a story in there to try to help um, build an audience for the anthology because what it is is it's a fundraiser for the group. You know, it's it's like $10, and so that goes into the – and I'm the treasurer, so I get to see that go directly into the general fund. Um, but, you know, I, we retain the rights, and we can republish, so I took those, I packaged them together, and so I now have that and the novella on Book Funnel and uh, – uh, I'm about to hit uh, a thousand people on my newsletter list. Finally, um, you know, up from you know, just I mean, a couple dozen, and then you just go and go. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, having those those free things out there, um, it, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, I've found, because you have a lot of people who want the free thing, and so they go and get the free thing, and then, you know, the next time you send them an email, you're like, oh, he's not giving away to the free thing while well, I'm not unsubscribed. So, you know, hopefully I can retain uh, 50 to 70%, uh, and I'm running those through the end of December, and, and then I'm going to go ahead and reach out and try to get people – on my social platforms to sign up for the newsletter. Uh, and so, you know, I have my, the following on here, if I can get, you know, 10% of, you know, those folks, then that's, you know, going to be like another thousand. And, you know, um, but speaking of the importance, we're seeing the importance right now with what's happening on Twitter, uh, because, you know, that started to melt down and I haven't been on Twitter in, I'll bet it's been two or three months uh, or at least one full month. And so what I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to go in there and say, I'm going to keep, you know, I'm not going to delete this account, but if you want to hear from me, don't look here. I've already told them that, you know, I'm mostly on TikTok, but I'm going to give them a link and say, subscribe to my newsletter if you want to keep hearing from me on a, on a regular basis, because, you know, that's going to be the best way for you to do that. And if Twitter goes completely under, uh, there are, you know, if authors who are using that primarily, uh, if they don't have a lot of those people on their newsletter list. They are going to have people who are not engaged with them, who um, you know, uh, if they love their books, they won't forget about them. But, you know, um, you, people have to see, have to be reminded that you're out there and you exist and that your books are out there in order to, to sell them. So, um, you know, I really didn't think much about newsletters until someone pointed that out. And that's why I'm, you know, made a redoubled my efforts to build my newsletter list because, uh, and, you know, even TikTok, let's say that, uh, you know, the winds change politically here in the U.S. and they say, oh, you know, we're going to, you know, China, you know, China's stealing our stuff and we're going to say no more to TikTok. Well, I mean, you know, that's um, that's all it is. Uh, so, yeah, like that newsletter, I tell people, if you only focus on uh, two things, uh, focus on one social media that you really that you enjoy, um, where it's not a, it's not a chore, it's not laborious and it's not something that you're going to do for a month and then quit if it's something you can stick with. And the newsletter list. Those are the two most important things that I, I tell people to focus on. Um, so, so Lou, uh, you know, your debut novel is out. Uh, and I, I saw in one of your videos that you say it took 30 plus years uh, for, you to, for you to get it written. Take us through a little bit of that, uh, of that journey because, uh, you know, the joke is you have your whole life to write your first book. And then, you know, you have six months to write your second um, but, you know, 30 plus years is a long publishing journey, even for the people who embrace that. So uh, tell us about it. Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> I think the answer is um, that I became a lawyer. <laughs> oh, oh. Gotcha. oh, yeah. Not oh. much time to write creatively whenever you're working no. 70, 80 hours a week as a lawyer. <laughs> no. So, so kind of that's what I did. Um, yeah. So I, I did that straight from school. You know, so I did school, I did O-levels, which is really ageing me, obviously. I did O-levels, I did A-levels, then I did a law degree, then I did law school, then I did law training, then I was a lawyer, then I ran an office. Um, you know, that was 30-odd years, like, vanished in a, fl in, a fl in a flash. I always, I mean, I've always loved books. My parents are both teachers. So, you know it was reading or you're out the door really so reading is <laughs> yeah. just reading's just always been you know kind of like breathing really like we thought you know they they always read all of it all of our houses as kids were like full chocker block every space crammed with books and what have you so I kind of got that you know whether I liked it or not but fortunately I did um and but as I say and I decided this was the career for me. I did it. I mean, I, I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, it was it was interesting. Um, then I got married and had kids, which wasn't in the plan anywhere. But anyway, I did. Oh, you know, it happened. You know, these things happen. So I had the kids. Um, and unfortunately, lawyers are not very good at letting uh, mums go back to work. Um, uh, you know, and juggle all that kind of stuff. So. It just didn't work out for me. Um, my son um, is autistic, so um, he's needed me a lot like in terms mm -hmm. of support and being at home. Um, and then I got sick. Um, so about six years ago, <clears throat> I got this 
I just had a virus, like, you know, like a throaty, virusy thing. And I got out of bed one morning and the world was going round and round and round at about 100 miles an hour. Um, and it's never got better. So um, it was just at the stage, typically, where my son, my son is a bit older now. He is getting a bit more independent. He, you know, he doesn't need me quite as much. And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to go back to work. I'm going to go and I'm going to get my life back. <laughs> Um, and then I got sick so yeah and it wasn't very nice and it took me about mm, it took me about six years to actually get a diagnosis and for someone to be able to tell me what the problem was um, other than telling other than telling me that I was losing my mind which was kind of where it got to the, you know by the end um, but I did finally get an answer long story short um, and I was like what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Because, um, yeah, this problem I have, um, it, you know, it, it continues, basically. Um, and the chances are it's it will never get, I'll never be completely like I was mm. before. So I just get this vertigo a lot. Um, oh, wow. uh, worse when I'm tired or if I get, you know, if I get a cold or something like that, my brain um, can't sort of quite cope. But basically what's happened is, um, my balance system in one side um, got knocked out by the virus and then your brain is meant to be able to kind of recalibrate you mm -hmm. but for some people that just never happens so anyway that's uh -huh. what happened um, and then I saw a I saw a post on Facebook that was talking about NaNoWriMo which I'd never heard of so I sort of did a bit of digging and I thought oh, I can write 50,000 words in a month. Of course I mm -hmm. can. Why not? <laughs> so I sort of signed up to do that. Um, and I did it. I did 50,000 words. Oh. I mean, it wasn't the end of the book. Nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, did, I had no idea what I was doing. I, you know, I didn't. I started, I think I started three days before the 1st of November. So all that six-week planning thing that everyone does, I didn't get any of that. <laughs> yeah. So I just yeah. sort of wrote down, you know, I just kind of thought, well, uh, what should I write about? Um, and it was sort of pandemic time. Um, and literally, um, my daughter's a dancer, a very good dancer. Um, and so we love like theatre and, you know, ballet and stuff like that. We've always loved stuff like that. And obviously all that kind of stuff was shut. Like the theatres were all closed. Um, all the artists were like, you know, going to the vaccination centres because they didn't have any work and like it was literally looking like like the theatres were all going to go bust and like we were never going to see the you know never going to see anything again um and that kind of was the spark for the idea of um you know what would it be like to live somewhere I kind of thought well what would it be like to live in a world where we didn't have any creative people what you know mm -hmm. Where there yeah. wasn't art or, you know, paintings or sculptures or theatre or dance or whatever. And then I thought, oh, I'll stretch that a bit further. What if it was illegal? What if those things were kind of frowned yeah. upon? You know? So that's kind of where the idea for this society came in. And then I love, I love like true crime type stuff. I love like Midsummer Murders. I love Luther, mm -hmm. all those kind of things. So the, those two things kind of got squished, kind of squished together. And that was my idea and that was all I had. And I just, I just wrote. Um, I didn't really have any intention of, I didn't have any intention of like thinking about publishing it um, because I didn't even know then that self-publishing was a thing. I just wrote mm -hmm. the story because I was like, what am I going to do with, <laughs> with yeah, my life? Right, right. And there we go. <laughs> and that was my first book. So, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, raised an interesting question that I'll, I'll get back to you, Lou. Uh, but I want to ask Jay first, um, you know, what uh, what led you to choose uh, independent publishing? Because, uh, you know, for everyone out there, I have uh, published four novels with two different, uh, they call it uh, small presses, small independent uh, presses who uh, did not give me huge advances and, you know, uh, anything like that. Uh, but they, they definitely did a lot of the work that I didn't know how to do and didn't want to do myself. So, uh, so we'll start with you, Jay. What what made you decide that independent publishing uh, was the way for you to go about getting all of your stories out there? I just think I don't like being told what to do. 
I think I think that's yeah, what it yeah. is. I I don't know. I don't know. I like being in control of what I do. So I thought if I can do this, and plus I, I'm I'm not shy of a challenge either. So you know I've not got it right all the time. I've published books too quickly and I've had to pull them back. Um, and it's much more of a learning process. Plus, I want to be. I want to have creative control over something I have. So, um, so if I, if I was to publish um, uh, through a you know traditional publishing platform, I, I'm basically handing over my story to them, and they can do what they, whatever they like with it. They can say we like this bit, but we want vampires in it, or you know, romance is bigger well, than it. We want this in it. We want this. And it's like um, not as bad and, as all that, but yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of there is a lot of compromise, especially but, yeah. you know, with, with, but, with covers and stuff like that. You know, and that's the way for people who may not know out there. Uh, that's sort of the way that um, uh, whenever you go into traditional publishing, uh, you know, the word the words are the one thing that you uh, have the most control over. And you'll have an editor, and they will see just a lot of stuff, and you can reject those edits. Now you run mm-hmm. the risk of them saying, "Well, we don't find this to be acceptable yeah, for yeah. the language in the contract," and you just part, you just go your separate ways, and you may have to pay back in advance if you got one. Uh, but you know, that's um, when they talk about you know your rights that you sign away when you sign a traditional publishing contract. Um, you always uh, retain the copyright, and very very literally, what that means is you have the rights to the copy. Copy being words, you know, that's just uh-huh. another word for words. So you always hold that copyright. So you approve um, the words that get put out there. Now you want to do some compromising and a good editor like they are in the indie world, uh, in the traditional publishing world, they make a lot of good uh, suggestions and you should listen to your editors. Uh, being an editor and being uh, an author, I will always, I will always say that. But, uh, you know, that's the thing that you have the copyright. What you sign over are a lot of, you know, a lot of your other rights. So the cover, the title, um, you know, how they package and sell, how they market, all of that is what the publisher has control over. So uh, for those of you who may not have known, it's it's not quite as scary as, as what Jay said. They're not going to make you insert vampires and werewolves into your uh, into your sweet romance story. But um, if, if they if, if they don't think that you're working with them and uh, you have completely different visions for the story, they can say, all right, well, we're just going to, you know, let, you know, thanks, but no thanks. So that that's how that works. Uh, but yes, it, it's it, it is total control, and that's when people ask me, you know, um, uh, let's see, well, what 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 do we write? Okay, well, you know, so we have a question. That's a good one, good one to answer. Uh, I write crime fiction and thrillers. Jay writes uh, uh, everything that's on the darker side of literature: dark fantasy, horror, uh, you know, darker thrillers and things like that. And then Lou, yours is a little bit speculative. Uh, but I, I thought I, I thought at its heart it was really, um, you know, more of a traditional mystery, an Agatha Christie type of not amateur sleuth, you know, somebody who's not a paid uh, detective or cop or or journalist or something like that. And so, um, so Jay answered the question, you know, total control. And from somebody who does so many different things, that makes a lot of sense that you'd want to have all that control over over your product. Uh, so, so Lou, uh, you know, you wrote something that. Uh, you know, traditional mysteries have a huge market and they have a huge traditional market. Um, you know, the speculative stuff aside, uh, go ahead and finish your story about how you got from overcoming so much, by the way, that's very inspiring. I'm so glad you told us that story. Overcoming so much and, you know, getting words down, having a story. Uh, how did you decide that you were A, going to publish it all and B, that um, indie publishing was the best way for you to go? Um, well, you might have noticed that I was giggling a bit while I was listening to Jay and his idea of someone telling him to put something yeah. in his book he didn't like. But it made, that just made me laugh because I am a complete control freak, so I completely get that. Yeah. Um, I think for me, I think it was probably two things. The control thing um, and B, I feel like um, I haven't got time. <laughs> I haven't got time to wait around for a query or um you know i'm i'm already of a certain age um and i kind of this is this is the first time in a long time i think since i you know since having the kids and being a mom and stuff like that this is the first time in a long time that i've actually felt excited about something um and enjoy, you know sort of enjoying something that's mine um and I didn't really want to give that up to, to mm-hmm. anybody. Um, 
and I kind of I think also because of my health because of the health situation I need to feel I think I need to feel like I can sort of dictate the speed of stuff Mm -hmm. you know so if I'm having a bad spell with the swirlies as I call it um you know I need to be able to take a break you know and not do stuff um so I didn't really want to be I didn't want to be sort of beholden to anybody else I I need to be able to set my own schedule Mm -hmm. and you know be able to sort of move it but mainly it's because I'm a control freak like Jay happens to the best of us Lou happens to the best of us (laughs) yeah and you know that that, that's a great reason uh and and, you know uh I I do work for uh yet a third another uh small traditional style press where you know we have the contracts and do the cover and all that stuff um but uh what we do at blue handle publishing and the reason why i went to work for them and actually i kind of asked if i could have a job there and uh fortunately everything's worked out really well is because you know they are trying to help change traditional publishing and some of the things we don't like about it and and even me having worked for two different small presses they are two they are different very uh in that you know they're, they're two very different organizations black rose who did Divided States on my debut uh, deep background, and Fox Press, who did my Bartholomew Beck books, like The Guilty Pay and The Price of Silence and the prequel novella. Um, you know, uh, and, and I, I learned, you know, what works in terms of, of marketing and that sort of stuff. Uh, but then, you know, they're editing and they tell you up front, Black Rose is that it's, uh, uh, you know, we don't really do a whole lot of editing. You know, please do that on your own because... Um, you know, that's not our strong suit. And then Fox Press, who amazing, amazing editors, great developmental line, all that stuff, a beautiful product, amazing covers. Um, but, you know, they, uh, they their books just don't sell as well for whatever reason. I don't know what all they, they both do, but I've seen a little bit of both. So I was able, you know, I said, if I'm going to go work for an organization like that, I want to take the things I like about both, put them in and make sure not to do the things that I don't like in term, in terms of everything, contracts, marketing, um, covers, editing, all of it. And so I'm in charge of the editing, which, you know, I'm not a control freak, um, but when it comes to comes to words and stuff like that, I kind of am. That's the one part that I really, uh, you know, uh, like to control. So that makes me happy to know that the books that come out, I, um, you know, there may be, uh, I have copy editors who edit behind me because, you know, you always need that. But in terms of the story and the line and the language and the metaphors and uh, uh, all the way down to where the paragraph breaks are, I like knowing that I had a lot of say in that and that it was a good conversation between the author and I to come to uh, something where we both really liked the vision uh, that the story took in, in, in the, that final product. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like at Blue Handle, we're trying to, uh, you know, say that you can, that the publisher doesn't have to be all about them. They can work with authors, not in a high, you know, like not hybrid publishing, like they don't pay us anything, but we still want to be their advocate. And so, that's uh um you know that's something that was important to me because yeah like traditional publishing you know has has major issues and they're getting worse by the day it seems like and then there are people who are like me who um you know didn't want to do the marketing and the book cover and some of the other stuff and so that's why you seek a publisher and if you have the patience uh which not everyone has definitely not Lou and and if you aren't as um if you aren't as protective <laughs> of some of that other stuff like the cover like the title like like the marketing uh then working with a publisher who acts as a partner is, can be a, a really a really great thing um so one thing i wanted to ask uh jay was i heard that you uh have really really good swag whenever you send books out to people uh so so we've been talking about marketing and stuff like that talk a, a little bit about um what you do and the kind of response you've gotten so marketing is the uh, is the devil on an indie's shoulder, which you don't really want to think about when they start, because people start thinking, oh, I want to write stories. Okay, I've written a story. No one's buying it. Hmm. Now, the, now the, the next side comes in, which is obviously the business side, and I think and I think what you find in traditional publishing now is they expect you to do more. Uh, so from what I've spoken to people anyways, they now expect you to do more marketing and more of a social media platform and stuff yourself. So I was thinking, well, if I'm doing it all myself anyway, I might as well do everything myself and, you know, be in complete control of it. So with the marketing side, I'm getting better. Um, I'm working like what you said, Rick, initially, uh, focused on the mailing list. I'm building that up. 
um, focus on one social media platform, which I'm doing more with TikTok. I've tried different ones. Uh, this is the one which I find gets the most engagement. I meet most people from, uh, and the one which the market seems to work the best. Um, <clears throat> But uh, but I like I just think what I'd, as a reader what would I like from a favorite author? So for example, um, I've sent out signed books with bookmarks and and um, you know and personalized notes and just to add that bit of personality to the reader as well. Um, and I think if if you can you're not you're not looking to fire a shotgun into a crowded room and hit everyone. You're trying to specifically go for the people which you know will like your will will like your stuff. So it's trying to. It's just trying to find what works, I think. So you maybe send something out on your mailing list. You don't want to be too pushy or you don't want to be too salesy. You want to offer some value as well. And then maybe every third email, you might promote one of your stories or say, I'm, I'm doing this, um, you know, next week. Who wants, who wants one or who, who wants a bundle or who wants to read a bundle? Um, I'm working on an advertising course at the minute. Uh, Mark Gorson's uh, Amazon mm -hmm. for Authors, Ad for Authors. I'm doing that at the moment. So working my way slowly through that. I think a lot of it is just trial and error. It's looking at what works um, and valuing the people that do take the time to reach out to you, to speak to you, and to purchase your stories. And even more so, the people that then come back for another story as well. I think you need to be true to your own brand. You need to be true to yourself. Because, like I said, you're not trying to get everybody. You're just trying to get a select few. So say if, you know, so someone used the analogy to me, so say if there's, there's this many readers in the world, you might only need this many to, to be able to make a career out of it. So you don't need to go to everybody. So you don't need to be um, someone what everybody likes. You don't need to give in to pressure. If someone says, oh, I like reading romance, why don't you write romance? Because that person probably isn't your reader, isn't your ideal reader. So <laughs> it's finding who... It's finding who your readership is and then thinking how would they think. So I know if I'm if I'm getting a book or something, if I'm learning, you know, if I'm if I'm finding out about an author, I want to get to know the author. And um, I follow a Canadian author called Keith Blackmore. And why he responded to me on Twitter and he, I, he was the best day of my life. And now we're on we've got we're Facebook friends now and I've got a free um he sent me a signed copy of one of his books, which I absolutely love. So I will now read whatever he produces in the future forever because I've built that connection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the that's the biggest marketing tool I can think is just be authentic, be yourself and um don't give up as well. Be try you know, trial and error, test things, see what works. But when you do find something that works um, cultivate and build a good relationship with those readers that have taken the time to come out and speak to you. And I think as well, don't rush it. I think people that want to get successful so fast and they want to see instant results so quickly, when that doesn't happen, they can give up. And it's it's the people that give up, uh, well, it's the people that just keep going when things are a bit slow or doesn't seem like much is happening. They're the people that do make a career out of it. Because all of their, you know, all the other authors or all the other people or whatever industry you're in, really, <clears throat> people who give up quite quickly are the ones who, well, they're just in it to get there fast and they're not in it for the love and the passion. They're in it for, I don't know, to try and make a name for themselves really quickly. And when that doesn't happen, they get discouraged. So, yeah. yeah I, 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 I tell people a lot that uh, publishing is not a get rich quick scheme. No. Uh, so if if you think that's what's going to happen, you're gonna you're gonna do nano, you're gonna bang out a, a story um, that's good enough for you to do like you know a, a quick uh, copy edit and send out, and you're you know gonna be um, you know a bestseller like that is not how any of this works. Even people who debut on um, on bestseller lists and things like that, it's usually about the fourth novel that they've written. They have three that they just you know put in, put in a drawer somewhere, or it's about the fourth time they've rewritten whatever they're working on. Or, or something like that. You, you, there's no way to get around putting in the time. You would have to be, you know, an exceptional talent. Uh, and, and all of us who write and get published, you know, uh, have very varying levels of talent. It's a spectrum. You'd have to be on, on the on the far end of just like you were born to write amazing fiction. You know, no matter what else you were doing with your life, to be able to do anything that resembles that. It takes years, kind of, no matter how you go about it. So that's what I tell people: you're going to put in a ton of work, and it's going to take this long how what kind of work do you want to put in and um you know what is your end game is your end game 
um, you know, uh, good good sales, you know, online uh, is your end game interacting with readers at, a, at you know, on, on a book tour type situation is your end game a bestseller list is your end game to put out stories that are very personal to you and that really, really move, you know, your segment of readers like Jay was talking about. And so those are the kind of questions that help people figure out, you know, how they want to go about this thing. Uh, so, so Lou, uh, I wanted to, uh, I'll ask you two questions. One, have you found any, any fun marketing things, uh, you know, swag or anything like that that has really worked for you? And then for both of you, uh, a big part of marketing that doesn't always kind of get put in that bucket is your cover. And you two have really great covers. So how did you uh, go about developing and, and getting those covers done? But, uh, but Lou, why don't you talk about some of the marketing things that you found that have worked for you? Ooh, well, my sort of my brand of marketing is normally comes probably with sort of making a fool of myself is what I normally do. Um, I mean, you, if you look at my TikTok profile, you'll see exactly what I mean. I mean, I you know I'm I'm game for anything really. You know, I'm not I'm not <laughs> I'm not proud. I'm not I'm I just I'm just at that time of life where. I really could give a shit what I look like, you know. So I, um, I think definitely part of mystery, part of mystery writing is that kind of slightly slapsticky, um, you know, sort mm -hmm. of a desensitizing foil to the to the sort of what we know is really going on behind the scenes, which I won't mention because we might get flagged. But <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I think because I kind of write that, that is part of my personality anyway. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I'm, you know, that's kind of what I'm like anyway. So I tend to do like stupid things like, you know, I'll dress up as, you know, some forensics man and pretend that someone's, won't say it, in the bathroom in my house. Oh. And then I'll, <laughs> yeah. you know, lay out objects and, you know, work, try and, and I'm saying to people, you know, who did this kind of thing and I'll do that in a video and then I'll I'll put the video in my newsletter and then people are watching the video so I, I do definitely lean on that kind of slightly madcap yeah side of and, and I can and see it, that and you, I can see and that and your, video, and your videos are hilarious uh, <laughs> and, and I know I know I know Tanya's saying this in comments too but uh, if you go to her page uh, she's doing 12 days of Christmas and they are they are great <laughs> Very creative. Obviously, took a little bit of planning. Uh, you know, I'm. Uh, I need to get back and start scripting some of the stuff that I, I put uh, put on my page. I um, I got to, there was a holiday, then I got uh, sick for a while, and so trying to catch up on you know my my job job that pays the bills and, and doing all that stuff. I'm I'm further behind than I need to be. Uh, but then because we are starting to running out run out of time a little bit. Um, uh, why don't you, Lou, and then Jay talk about uh, where you got your covers and where the inspiration came from and whether or not you dictated most of what the final version was or uh, what that collaboration was like with your, um, with your artist. Well, my, my cover's a bit of a story. Got to say, I think I'm on my, uh, let me think, uh, I think I'm on about the fourth iteration of the cover. Oh, wow. Um because that's how important the cover that's how important the cover is. I mean, I'm I'm doing everything on a shoestring is kind of the way I mm -hmm. like to I mean, I I'm very much obviously because I'm not working, so I'm very much approaching my business on the tenet that everything has to be sustainable. It's all got to fund itself. And when you've only got one book out um and no one knows who you are, um that's really tough. You know, um, people are buying the book, but not in, you know, not in massive numbers, because like Jay said, you're building a platform, aren't you? You're, and I and I try and think of it as like I'm building it one reader at a time. And and if and that's kind of what you were saying about the long game kind of, you know, you're not going to suddenly get loads of people who want to <laughs> read it. You, you literally are building it brick by brick, read yeah. by reader hoping that eventually it will, there will be a snowball at some point and, you know, things will pick up. That's kind of how I, that's kind of how I've approached it. So my first, very first cover I created on Word. Wow. There you go. <laughs> um, because it was the best I could do at the time. Um, it 
wasn't really right, you know. So then um, when I when I made from the release, when I, I made a, a bit of money from the release, I then managed to get a pre-made, um, which was slightly better. Um, but I think because the book is a bit of a weird hybrid, it's not <laughs> entirely right in the genre that, it, right. you know, that I need it to be really. So then finding the, finding the right cover has been really, really tricky. But the current cover I've got, which is kind of this um, illustrated, let me find it for you. So it's kind of like this yeah. <clears throat> green sort of illustrated. Um, I think much more reflects the book because it's it's got that kind of, obviously you've got your sleuthy vibe, but it's mm -hmm. also got, it's got a sort of a quirky, a quirkiness, yeah. which just yep. fits the kind of weirdness, weirdness of the sort of hybrid nature. So, um, and that is from um, Get Covers. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're um, part of Mibble Art. They're Ukrainian. So obviously I'm supporting Ukraine at the same time. But their covers are actually, um, they're designed by um, kind of like training designers. So these are people who okay. are still sort of in the training stages. Um, mm -hmm. They're really, really reasonable. And they will give you a professional looking cover when you're on a budget like I am. So that's kind of the story of the cover. And since it's changed to this, um, my ads are working better, I think, because I think people yeah. can look at the book and know more what they're getting. So, yeah, it's really exactly. important that cover. <clears throat> and, and then, so, Jay, you know, you have different covers that have to fit into different genres. Uh, you know, what, what's that like uh, for you to, to get the right covers, depending on the types of stories you're writing? So certainly as, uh, as I've progressed with the creation uh, and the more books I've written, the more I've looked into before I've, so I've perhaps got a concept for an idea uh, for a cover, what I kind of want it to look like. Then I'll go on to bookstores, book, you know, um, uh, book, I can't think of the name, places where they sell books. <laughs> book vendors, that's the one. Yeah. So it's a bit, a bit tired now. Uh, so we'll go on that book vendors um, and I'll go, okay, what stands out to me? So I'll type in my genre. I'll go, okay, what stands out? That one does. Why does that one stand out? And then I'll look and I'll go a few different ones and I'll, I'll take them as kind of reference and ideas and I'll think, right, okay. Um, and I'll gauge it off that and then I'll approach a designer. No, we'll go on Fiverr. Uh, I'll approach a designer from there. Um, some can be really expensive. Some can be you know, next to nothing. I've, I've done the next to nothing before. It wasn't very good. And I've had to then get a, a new cover done. Um, so I know what kind of mid-range I'm looking at now. So I have a specific designer which I go to. They've done um, my last couple of, well, they did both my dark fantasy books, which I was quite happy with, um, with that. But my first ever covers, so I did The Space Between Heaven and Hell, which is my uh, my horror thriller. Um, and... I went initially, like it was like five pounds for us, a design of Fiverr. Wasn't very good. I had it produced, and I just think because I was so excited to have a book out, I was like, "Yeah, go on, let's release it. Yeah, it's great." And then I was like, "Actually, it's it's not it's not great that." So I pulled that back, um, and then uh, and then I got a design done by a professional graphic designer. The only issue is. I now can't get that done because it's my ex-girlfriend's friend um, and we, it wasn't a very good relationship. Well, we'll leave it there. She's an inspiration, actually, to a couple of my stories, but we won't, we won't talk about that. Um, but unfortunately, like, she was a really, really good cover designer, so then I had to go, oh, great. I now need to find someone else. But, yeah, so I, I definitely have a concept. I have, like, a theme, what kind of... You know, uh, what typically would you see in a thriller uh, cover? What typically would you see in a mystery or a, a horror book uh, or a dark fantasy? I'll then get some inspiration, maybe like a bit of a pin board, um, get some ideas. And then I'll approach a designer with, with the ideas and I'll send them all the different uh, things of reference. And then we go from there and they'll send me something. Um, I've never accepted a, a design first time. I've always gone... You know, I, I like I like that. I really like all this bit, but can we make this a bit different? And then maybe I'll get one or two friends to look over it. Maybe I'll send it out to my newsletter and say, "What do you think? Do you would you know mm -hmm. if you saw this book, what would you think?" Um, I want to make sure that the the title conveys uh, the cover conveys the genre. Um, I want to make sure that the color scheme, if there is a bit of a theme going on in the series, want to make sure it matches up to that. So we've got to be conscious of branding. It's all just stuff which I've learned the more I've done it. 
um, and research and then looking at what works and what doesn't work. Um, so yeah, just that, I think it's just experience and just finding the right person as well, really. It'll never come out the way you imagine it, but as long as, but sometimes it comes out better than you imagine it because they obviously have a much bigger experience and repertoire of um, mm-hmm. of ideas and, and designs. So I'm very happy with all my covers now, uh, but it has been a bit of a, let's pull it back, let's, you know, a bit of to and fro. And so again, it's just experience. And I think just, just not rushing the project is, a, is another thing what I've learned. Um, like I said earlier, I've sometimes rushed projects, produced them too early, and then I've had to pull them back. And it just doesn't look very good for yourself. But again, you only learn by messing up, don't you? You don't you don't learn if you get it right all the time. Um, yep. And then the next book, all right, I'll, I've got more of an arsenal of things and tools what I can go for. So it's all this experience, in, in my opinion, anyway. You know, I it, it sounds like a weird analogy, but I've always, uh, uh, you know, considered the importance of, a, of, of your cover, uh, especially in, in indie publishing, where that's one way, easy way to tell that somebody did it themselves versus maybe not. And so that's one of, one of the, where there can be the biggest uh, disparity between, um, you know, any published and traditionally published authors, just, you know, just by a glance, just by the icon that's on Amazon. Um, so I compare the cover to the tires on, on your car. They are so important. They are the thing that's literally keeping you from, you know, dying, you know, there on, on the blacktop when you're driving, that if you're going to invest a lot of money in anything up front consistently, it should be your covers because they, mm-hmm. they, they are they're the one thing that can, um, you know, get people to look at your book or can keep them from looking at your book. Yeah. You know, they're, 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 they're one of the most important things. So even if you're driving a car that's rusted out, cracked windshield, you know, doesn't run super great, but the one thing you should have on it is good tires. You know, don't, that's the one thing not to skimp on. So, you know, that's, uh, that's what I tell people whenever they're asking, uh, about covers. We're going to answer this one question in the comments and then we're probably going to wrap it up. Um, so when you're talking about how do you under- see and understand your vision for a book cover? And that's a good question because I don't think artistically like that very, I think visually in terms of story and, you know, the, the sort of movie that plays in your head when you're writing and, and when you're reading, but in terms of book covers, I have to be shown options and then go from there. Uh, but, but, you know, both of you, whenever you are discussing, you know, what you think you want your cover to look like in your vision, uh, you know, how, how do you, how do you convey that? How, you know, cause like me, I wouldn't even be able to, to put it into words, but uh, so, so like, you know, what, what do you tell them? Like, oh, I want it to have, you know, like a, like a, a, a silhouette, uh, you know, on the cover and I want it to be illustrated, but also I want it to be green. Is it really just like that, or or do you send them like stuff on Pinterest? Like that's what one of my uh, publishers did. They said go on Pinterest and find some covers you like that just have the feel that you want yours to feel like. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to give this a shot. I don't really, I don't really know what you're talking about. So so very quickly because it's about to be, I think it's about one o'clock your time. So very quickly, how did you go about you know uh, talking with your artists about what it, what your cover was going to look like? Lou, you go first, mate. Okay. I'm wondering if you've had access to my emails because what you just said sounds exactly <laughs> like what I did. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you've been snooping on me. <laughs> so, so, so basically, um, I kind of, like like Jay said, um, I looked at like the top, hun- like the bestsellers in mystery and I looked at them all and I thought, yeah, they're right. No, they're not right. And then I obviously I collected probably about ten or fifteen I think that I that I liked, and I sent them across. But I also said, you know, my book is a bit weird. <laughs> my book's a bit yeah. weird, so we need a way of, you know, we need a way of conveying that. And you're right. I mean, I'm not I'm not particularly artistic in that kind of design sense. Well, I don't think I am anyway. Um, but I knew I knew I needed a sleuth. I knew I needed that to be on the cover because that's a big thing, in, you know, with mystery. Um, and I just wanted to pick out some of the elements um, that do relate to the story. Um, I knew it needed to be illustrated because it isn't a cosy, but it it it's what I call not so cosy or cosy ish because mm-hmm. it has it's got it's got some of that flavour with with it. Um, so illustrated, 
was again something that I kind of picked up and thought I needed to get that and then and then the rest of it to be honest came from the designer I think I think it's definitely a partnership it's definitely something where you need to trust like for, for me because it the comp because this covers ended up being a company that does book covers um I think you do need to trust that they know they probably know more about the market mm -hmm. in terms of what's current than you do because when you look on the stores it can be really overwhelming and mystery mm -hmm. in particular the covers are all over the place yeah you've got so oh, yeah. many different yeah. types it's actually quite difficult to pin down what does the mystery cover look like so it's kind of a this is what I think but what do you think and then a kind of a meeting of minds there that's how I would describe it a meeting of minds Gotcha. MJ, how about you? Um, very similar, really. So you have to give them, um, I don't know. So you will go, I like this idea, um, but I would need the cover to show um, an element of sci-fi. I need it to have a, a strong female lead character on there. Um, I need it to have, you know, uh, some kind of a cool aspect, maybe this kind of color, uh, as well as, these points for reference as well so these are the covers for reference and then i basically just hand it all over to them and go right work your magic and uh i hope it looks okay and then it comes back and i'm like oh that's not bad actually that's better than what i could do yeah so uh yeah yeah um but no rick like like you said i mean completely you know it you, your book cover can either it can make someone click by or it can someone make someone go if they're not going to spend any time getting a decent cover then what kind of quality is the work going to be because there's a lot of steps between before someone uh, clicks that buy button, and the biggest first step is we're visual creatures, don't we? So we look, we we see the cover first, and then we'll read the copy. Then we'll read. Then we'll do a look inside yeah. feature. Then we'll check the price. Then we'll check the reviews. But the first thing to even get people to do all that is the cover. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit of handing over creative control to somebody else, and I don't mind it so long as I'm happy with what they do. Um, and then again, you know, you work with different creators, work with different different illustrators, different designers, and then you build that relationship. And then you can trust that person, trust that designer, um, and then hopefully you get good feedback from it. So, but I think it's uh, I think it is important that certainly if you do have a, a main on this, or you do have trusted people that that you like. I mean, your friends and family all day will tell you how good it is. Well, like, oh, it's amazing. That it's lovely. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> you need to go to people that maybe aren't that person with you and say hi what what firstly not just do you like it but what genres does, does this convey to you when you look mm -hmm. at this what do you think when you see it and and why as well um and kind of look at it that way and then you can take that back to the to the designer so as you can tell my designers have to be quite patient with me <laughs> yeah <laughs> get a bit meticulous um there but, you uh, go. can i ask uh, you two a question that'd be okay uh you know, really quickly, obviously, you guys are the ones that are staying up super late for us. But uh, but I, I think we'll make this uh, the last question we answer. But go ahead and ask it. Okay. okay. Um, do you plot or do you just write and go? Like, do you pants? Do you plot? How do you work? Uh, I'll go ahead and a answer that. I got a pretty quick answer. I uh, um, what, what I what I've uh, developed over the course of a few a few novels is. I like to I like to uh, you know pants. I like to do the exploratory writing through about the first act get to an inciting incident I really like, and then go through and figure out where I'm going from there. But uh, that allows me to start out the novel focusing more on my characters and figuring, who they, figuring out who they are and what their setting is. It allows me to change some of that stuff, change personalities if I have to change the name and do all that You know, while I'm still in, in the part of the story that is built for introducing your characters and your world to your reader, uh, where, where that's you know kind of the most important thing and then after that, I do. I don't do super hardcore plotting. I don't use like the index cards and that sort of stuff because uh, my brain just doesn't work that way. I just uh, I I refer back to what I learned in uh, you know uh, middle school and high school. You know, uh, grade school for you guys. Just uh, you know, like uh, Roman numerals and bullet points, and you know, just uh, going from top to bottom in a word document. And then I go in and, and, and I, I fill it in uh, from there. So so I'm kind of in the middle, but that's sort of my my process. And uh, and Lou, I think you uh, you did a video pretty recently when you were talking about uh, plotting your book. So it sounds like you're probably a plotter, especially if you're a mystery writer. Yeah, 
it's a bit of a weird one, this one, I think. Um, being a lawyer in a previous life, um, I'm quite detail or I'm quite a detail oriented personality anyway. So I'm I'm definitely a planner, a scheduler, all those things. But when I come to being creative and using my imagination, it seems to all go out the window. So I what I do is I call myself a plotzer. So um I plot or I, I try to anyway. So I have I have my idea. I definitely know where I'm starting and I definitely know where I'm finishing. I definitely have that in my head. And then I create, similarly, I create a kind of a bullet point, kind of like an A to B, you know, as if I was going on a bus somewhere. And I think, mm -hmm. oh, how am I going to get from, from here to here? And often that's, I have that quite detailed. I'm like the opposite, I think. I have the first two acts, I... I chunk mine up into four acts so i have the first two acts the first half of the book pretty much nailed down and then i'll start writing uh and then as i'm writing my brain goes oh this is a good idea why don't we do this <laughs> and then i go off oh, somewhere completely different and yeah. sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't but i really want to be a plotter i want to be a plotter because i think <laughs> I think it would be quicker. I think it would be, mm -hmm. I think it would be easier because what I do is I get to a certain point and my brain is going, hmm, but you haven't figured out what's happening next, have you? And right. then I'm like, oh, I've got to figure out what's coming next. So then I get stuck where I am because my brain is trying to figure out what comes next. So basically I just, yeah, I'm just going around in a circle. So I want to be a plotter. So that is my goal. I'm declaring it on TikTok. My goal for 2023 is I'm going to be a plotter. Repeat after me. I'm going to be a plotter. <laughs> and see, so, mine, is, mine is the exact opposite. I had to sit down and resist the urge to completely plot everything out because um, I, I want to work on, uh, to grow as a writer, I want to work more on um, on my characters and then having them kind of kind of figure out the plot for me once I get mm -hmm. to know them well enough. And then, you know, they can kind of tell me, where, where they think the plot should go. And uh, and Jay, what about you? How do you, um, what's your process sort of like? Sit down to a blank page and see what comes out. Start to finish. I do not know what's going to happen next. Like I'm writing a crime series at the minute and there's plenty of times where I've sat there and gone, I haven't got a clue how she's going to get out of this part. But then you figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing with that is you write the first draft. So you're not writing the finished yeah. thing straight away. Yeah. So then you get from from A to B, you get from the start and you go, right. And I, I keep I keep notes as I'm going. Um, but I, uh, I've, I've tried plotting before uh, and uh, I, I've, I've plotted this big, long novel. It was a, you know, a dark romance to go when it's a thriller and, um, you know, something happened. She's having an affair and he lied about a pregnancy and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I killed the main character in the first chapter. Couldn't help myself. Killed him off straight away. Yeah, and uh, at that moment, I went, it's not for me, this. So, but I just find it so fun. I mean, there's some parts in it where you feel like pulling your teeth out because you are trying your hardest to get to the story going, and, and because you, you've not a clue what you're doing, you're just running in, running into the mist and hoping you don't bang into anything. Um but yeah, uh, I think it teaches a lot of discipline as well if you if you don't plot because you have to force yourself to figure out what's going on. And a lot of what you said, Rick, is you like you know um, you build the characters, um, you build the characters, and then the characters kind of tell the story for you. Um, and I really like that. And plus, I I would find it boring if if I plotted meticulously because then I've already written the story in my head. So then I don't need to write it on the paper. I through not plotting and just writing as you go. I get excited by the scenes and I get excited and I'm like, I can't wait to sit down and write what happens next. I can't wait to find out what happens next. It's as if I'm reading yeah. the book for the first time as mm -hmm. I'm writing it and I find it really yeah. exciting. Um, so yeah, it's frustrating at times, but it, uh, <laughs> it, it seems to work for me. So maybe it says a lot about my mind and personality, but anyway, so yeah, I don't plot a thing. I love that. All right. Well, yeah, I like that. I like that our panel tonight had uh, had three very, very different angles and aspects going into that. And that's usually what happens whenever I'm at conferences and I'm on panels and I'm either moderating or participating in that. That always comes up. Somebody talks about, do you plot, do you pants, what's your process? And everybody has their own unique takes. And, a lot, and you almost always, if you have at least three people, 
uh, three to four, you have somebody who is like Jane, who just like pants the hell out of their book. And then you have somebody like Lou, who uh, either is a hardcore plotter or wants to be. And then I'm always in the middle, like, well, here's my weird way of doing it. I don't recommend it because it's not very efficient, but here, here's how, here's how it happens anyway. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to call it. I'm going to start wrapping it up. Thank you too for staying up so late, by the way, it's like one fifteen your time, uh, Jay and Lou. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya, my executive producer. She's been down in the comments. Uh, you know, whenever I was sick, she was the one uh, booking everybody, you know, you know, she's who you go to for all the, for the scheduling. So, um, you know, this thing would not be happening without her. So thank you so much as always. And then tomorrow we're going to be back on our regular time uh, and our regular day of 7 p.m. Central Wednesday. And we're going to have Katie Carroll and uh, uh, Troy Duran with us. So that's going to be fun. Uh, and I'm not, and I'm going to give everybody uh, another minute to uh, uh, follow all of us. If you're, if you're not, if you've enjoyed what we've been talking about, we would love uh, to have you uh, follow us here on TikTok. And uh, if you go to our pages, you can find our, our web links and you, you can explore uh, what we're doing there. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us um, on a, a special uh, UK across the pond edition of Book Talk on Book Talk. And uh, I really liked, I really liked our discussion because uh, even though we exist in two different, uh, two different worlds and two different, you know, you guys are in the future, um, you know, that you know, no matter where you are, if you're writing, then, you know, there, there's a, a very special uh, set of things that we love to discuss that only writers understand. You know, we're, we're, we, we speak, uh, we speak a very common language. So thank you, Jay. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Tanya. Thank all of you who are out there watching. For those of you who just tuned in the last uh, little bit, I'm sorry, we're not going to keep it going, but uh, tune in, uh, tune in tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central Time. And, uh, you know, with uh, Katie and Troy, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, keep the discussion going. So thank you. And I uh, hope you guys are able to get a good night's sleep, even though I kept you up late. Oh, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much, Lou. It's been great to talk to you. Rick, thank you so much for having on. Tanya, thanks for coming on. Everybody who's, uh, who's commented, asked questions, you're all fantastic. And just like the videos and all the rest of it. So, no, it's been a pleasure staying up a little bit late, past my bedtime, uh, and uh, talking to you wonderful, wonderful <laughs> people. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed myself. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and uh, me too. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been great fun. Uh, I love talking. It's my favourite thing to do other than writing. So that's good. <laughs> Same here. Uh, yeah, so it's been fantastic. I'd like to do it again sometime. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's been all cool. right, all right. Thanks to everyone Thanks. in the comments. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. See you later. Bye.